Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alana Cadell Tucky. I am the director of the Office of Environmental Justice at the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. I will be presiding at this afternoon's public hearing, which is being held today, Wednesday, November 3rd, 2021. On the through the WebEx events electronic webinar platform. I am joined today by Samir Renati, the climate justice advisor to the climate action council. Elizabeth Bolton from the New York state energy research and development authority. Seema Nayak from the department of health's center for environmental health. Kyla Mainsa, the director of environmental justice with the New York power authority. I am also joined by Maureen Letty, the Director of the Office of Climate Change at DEC, and Maria Kachmar and Andrea Linton from the Department of Environmental Conservation's Office of Communication Services, who are assisting me today in running this webinar. These events are being recorded and will be posted on the Climate Act website as soon as practicable. If anybody has any technical difficulties during this hearing, you can call 518-402-9710. For assistance. Again, that number is 518-402-9710. The purpose of this hearing is to solicit public input and comment on barriers and opportunities for underserved communities. The Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act requires the Department of Environmental Conservation in collaboration with NYSERDA, the Department of Health, and the Power Authority to prepare a report on the barriers to and opportunities for access or community ownership of the following services and commodities in disadvantaged communities. Distributed renewable energy generation, energy efficiency and weatherization investments, zero emission and low emission transportation options, adaptation measures to improve the resilience of homes and local infrastructure to the impacts of climate change including, but not limited to microgrids. Other services and infrastructure that can be reduced the risk associated with climate related hazards, including, but not limited to shelters and cool rooms during extreme heat events, shelters during flooding events, and medical treatment for asthma and other conditions that can be exacerbated by climate related events. The goal of these hearings is to hear from the most important stakeholders in this process, all of you. Today's event, in addition to other outreach efforts to inform this report, is a, sorry, is in addition to other outreach efforts for this report, such as small group sessions that we held in October and an open invitation for written feedback. We will share what we are in development in and the development of the report and seek your input to ensure that we're headed in the right direction. This is the first of two public hearings. The second will take place tomorrow, November 4th at noon. Notice of this hearing was posted in the October 20th and 27th editions of the department's environmental notice bulletin. All persons, organizations, corporations, or government agencies that may be affected by these proposals are invited to submit either written or oral statements. The purpose of today's hearing is to take oral statements from the public, which will be incorporated into the report that will be completed. This is not a question and answer session, but an opportunity to hear your comments. If you do not wish to make an oral statement today, you may submit a written statement. Oral and written comments are given equal weight. The written statements may be submitted by regular mail or by email or by using the public comment form. Comments can be sent by email to opportunities.report at NYSERDA, N-Y-S-E-R-D-A dot N-Y Dot gov. Written comments may be sent regular mail and can be mailed to Elizabeth Bolton, B O U L T O N, at NYSERDA, N Y S E R D A, located at 17 Circle, so 17 Columbia Circle, Albany, New York, 12203. There is a, also a public comment form that can be found at climate.ny.gov slash events, uh, slash meeting, sorry, slash events, dash meeting, and meeting. So, I'm sorry, let me start over. Uh, Climate.ny.gov slash events, 
dash and dash meetings. Written comments must be sent by November 8th and will be incorporated into the report that is currently being worked on, but comments or feedback can continue throughout the process. Addresses uh, are posted on the screen at this time for those of you who are joining the hearing over the internet. Uh, after the conclusion of my remarks, we will begin uh, discussing the slides. Uh, if there's anybody who has any questions, speakers can, then we'll call on speakers, after which you will have an opportunity to leave your comments, and we ask that you use the raised hand button, and you will be called in the order in which your hand was raised. Okay, I believe we can move to the next slide. Okay, so this slide that we're looking at now describes the CL, the part of the Climate Leadership and Community, uh, Community Protection Act that directs agencies to develop the report. Uh, the report, as I said, is on the barriers to and opportunities for community ownership of services and commodities in disadvantaged communities. The report itself will be due on January 22nd. And the recommendations for the report are going to be included in the final climate action council scoping plan, which is due in January 1st of 2023. Uh, according to the climate leadership and community protection act, this scoping plan is going to act as a roadmap for how New York state is going to implement and achieve our greenhouse gas emissions and climate goals. The law that requires that the report be published and the recommendations for the report are going to all be included. So that should be available for folks to look at once the draft is available. Next slide, please. So to support in our efforts, uh, NYSERDA has brought in Loom to contract to assist with some of the information gathering. This is a multi-state effort, as I stated before, and there is a study advisor team that is providing oversight to the consultants on the development of this report. The study advisors are experts in the report topics uh, from DEC, NYSERDA, the Power Authority, the Department of Health, the Department of Public Services, and the Department of Transportation. Uh, they bring expertise in clean energy, energy efficiency, risk related to climate hazards, health impacts, adaptation measures, and clean transportation. Illum and industrial economics in, conducted some secondary research earlier this year. Uh, in a little bit, Samir will provide some details about their findings. Uh, we are now in the process of refining the research through the engagement process with all of you, and in particular, focusing on gaining insights from individuals that live in these communities and may have experience some of these issues firsthand. And as I said, this is the first of two public hearings. There will be another tomorrow at noon. Uh, we do not have plans right now to hold any additional hearings this year, but there are opportunities to provide input beyond these hearings. So if you do feel that this hearing, if you didn't get an opportunity to speak, there are always opportunities to submit comments. Well, we're working towards releasing the report at the end of this year, but that doesn't mean the work stops. The Once the report is released, these issues will continually be assessed by state agencies as we implement the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Uh, next slide, please. So, in the development of the barriers report, we wanted to hear from all New Yorkers early in the process. Uh, we wanted to the report to be responsive and reflective of the needs of all New Yorkers. And we especially wanted to encourage those who live and work in overburdened areas and under resourced areas to provide comments and input. We are looking for feedback uh, to inform the report. And like I said, that'll be issued at the end of the year. The for small group discussions were held and they focused on the topics the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act directed the report to cover. The small groups were topic focused and we focused on the participation of those who lived and worked in those areas. We're continuing the public outreach. Uh, we want to make sure that our findings are to date and we want to make sure that we hear from all of you and just let us know 
what are we doing wrong? What are we doing right? Uh, what are we missing? What could we be highlighting a little bit better? Um, like we said, the feedback in this meet we are seeking feedback, but we also encourage you that just because you give us feedback here, that doesn't preclude you from giving us additional feedback in writing. If you think of something later, uh, and we'll continue to constantly accept feedback. This is going to be a living. The goals for the scoping uh, plan to be living, breathing document. So we'll always be looking to improve. Uh, next slide. So, as I stated before, the final report will be released January 1st, 2022. We'll continue to receive comments after that. Uh, there was going to be some ongoing work related to the barriers and opportunities report, but we want to make sure that the feedback informs what happens after the report is out. Uh, the Climate Action Council is going to include recommendations from the final report into the scoping plan. And it will require DEC to produce implementation reports every four years. And these reports will provide assessments on the effectiveness of the programs and the policies, and including ongoing assessments of the level of access to the services and commodities examined in this report. So you'll have an opportunity at any point to comment on how successful you think those uh, actions are. And now I will hand it over to Samir for the next part of the presentation. Thank you. Great, thanks Alana. And good evening, everybody. My name is Samir Wanade. Um, Again, I'm the Climate Justice Advisor to the Climate Action Council. And I really wanna thank you for joining this hearing. Um, on this slide, I'll cover some of the early research that we did on this project. It's called secondary research because it's a review of the existing data and findings on the barriers that overburdened and under-resourced communities face in trying to access climate and clean energy program-related services and resources. Our project partners, Alum and IEC, did a thorough review of the reports and literature out there on these subjects that were, and the reports were produced by academic institutions, nonprofits and governments. We also took significant input from York State agency staff, and uh, we reviewed public comments from previous public hearings on these types of issues. All of this information that we gathered on the barriers was documented and then categorized so we could have a so we could have a rich understanding of the overarching issues that communities might face. Next slide, please. Before um, describing the barriers that we found, um, I know Alana touched on this already, but just want to revisit it again. These are the five different areas of study that uh, that the report required to look in, uh, to look into to find out what the barriers were. I also dropped something in the chat, a link uh, to our climate.ny.gov website where you can go. And to the events page and download the fact sheet where you can see these um, these five study areas listed. And I'd encourage you um, to have that to refer to. Um, so the areas are generating renewable energy like solar on the buildings that you live and work in. Next, there's weatherproofing homes and buildings and updating them with clean technology and materials like clean heating and cooling equipment, insulation and energy efficient windows. Next category, zero and low emission transportation options like electric cars, trucks, and buses, or being in a community that's designed to be amenable to walking and biking. Next category is making homes, buildings, and infrastructure resilient to the impacts of climate change. And the last category is reducing health risks with climate change and associated pollution. So in these areas, we wanted to examine the barriers and the opportunities. Next slide, please. So at a high level, I'll share the four categories of barriers that our team identified to the, to the services and resources in the five areas. First is 
physical barriers that might prevent access to programs like infrastructure and buildings that's so outdated or in a state of disrepair, it makes getting an upgrade particularly expensive and severe weather events more difficult to endure. The second is financial and economic barriers, like a lack of savings, unequal access to bank loans, and limited city budgets. The third is knowledge, perception, and information barriers, which could mean a lack of trust in service providers, previous negative interactions with the state or private sector, or language that's too technical and jargony to easily understand. And the fourth category is programmatic design and implementation barriers. This could be things like strict eligibility requirements that are too narrow or cumbersome to navigate, or just a lack of public awareness of what services and resources are available. We need your feedback that elaborates on these topics or describes what's missing. And we'd love for you to share what your experience has been and what you believe we can do to overcome these barriers and increase access to these vital services and resources. Next slide, please. And these are some of the questions regarding access and usability of program services and resources described in the five areas shown earlier. And these questions are just to help prompt your response, uh, the response of your comments. Like, so just think about what challenges do you or your community face in accessing or using the relevant services and resources? What opportunities do you see to make access to them easier? And what has your experience been with trying to use program services and resources that provide clean energy, the things that make the environment healthier, and clean air, and access to protection from storms, floods, extreme temperatures, and other climate impacts. Was it easy or hard for you to access these things, and why? And finally, what are your thoughts or experiences with actions to help overcome the barriers to accessing these program services and resources in your community? And um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Maria. And thank you so much for your participation and look forward to your comments. Okay, great. Thank you, Samir. Um, at this time, we're going to start calling on anyone that would like to make a statement um, this evening. And we would want to remind everyone that um, you've all been muted upon entry into the meeting. So if you'd like to make a statement, then you must raise your hand and um, to raise your hand you'll find that feature on the bottom of your computer screen near the participant button um, if you're a call-in user you can press star three to raise your hand um, we will call persons one by one to speak and um, if when we call your name if i've uh, mispronounced it i apologize but if you could state your name um, when we unmute your line and um, spell your name, that would be great. And tell us maybe uh, what city you're calling from. If you're speaking on behalf of someone or a group of people, identify who that is you are speaking or representing. Um, if When you speak, if you could just speak loudly, slowly and clearly. And for the courtesy of others wishing to speak, we have set a three minute time limit this evening. So we ask that you please summarize your oral statements this evening and um, to definitely feel free to submit lengthy or written statements by email or um, how it has been set up and we'll show those uh, addresses later on. Um, all other attendees can feel free to use the chat feature um, that's also at the bottom of the screen near the participant button. And you can type in a comment that way. Uh, Maria, um, uh, quickly before yeah. we uh, begin taking comments, I wanted to make sure that I introduce uh, Neil Muscatiello from the Department of Health. Hi, Neil. Sorry if I missed you earlier. Neil and I are both uh, agency 
representatives with the Climate Justice Working Group. I wanted to make sure that we acknowledge Neil. Good evening. Okay. Thanks, Alana. Right. So again, if there's anyone else present who wishes to make a statement on uh, the record this evening, you can indicate it by raising your hand and we'll begin taking um, callers as we see those. Um, Maria, do you want to make me the um, presenter and I'll share the timer? Absolutely. Hold on one second, Andrea. Oops. Okay, so let's see at this time. Um, I'm going to unmute um, Elizabeth Gillis. And your line is unmuted. Elizabeth, are you there? Would you like to make a statement? Uh, yes, it's Elizabeth Giles, G I L E S. I'm a public transit advocate from Buffalo. Um, I would say that in my work, um, me and uh, my fellow transit advocates have been very concerned about how all levels of government, including the state, have been um, reacting to the um, providing um, better transportation options for low income folks um, by, by proposing that we spend um, limited government funds on things like electric car charging stations in underserved neighborhoods. We would be much better served by improving and expanding public transportation options. Um, that it means, of course, more frequent buses, um, wider coverage of the public transportation um, routes with the destinations where um, public transit goes, and also um, maybe rapid transit where that is appropriate. Um, here in Buffalo, we have been striving to expand our light rail rapid transit system that was um, that was planned back in the 70s, really. We have um, the old rail rights of way that could be repurposed for this. Um, so we're concerned not only with the frequency of buses, but also that it does take some people up to two hours to get to, to work. Um, our response is, if you live in the city of Buffalo and it takes you two hours to get to work, that job had better be in Syracuse. Um, so, so I think I just wanted to summarize by saying, please um, find a dedicated source of funding for public transit, because usually that's the barrier is inadequate funding. We see um, that if New York State adopts the transportation and climate initiative, the 12 state initiative that New York has um, devoted itself to planning, but has yet to adopt, that those funds could produce 1.4 billion dollars a year that could be used for urban and rural public transportation we feel that's a very important opportunity not to miss thank you very much for your time great thank you and our next person i will unmute is a call-in user um two number starts with a seven your line is unmuted like hello this is lynn bruning fifth generation dwaynesburg in schenectady county in december of 2020 i submitted a letter to the clcpa outlining my personal experience with a 65 acre community solar project abutting my 2500 foot property line Today, I'd like to update the council on the current status of Oak Hill Solar Project. I will submit written documents in support of my statement. In July of this year, the new owner of the project approached the town planning board requesting to add four 53-foot containers of lithium-ion battery energy storage, doubling the square footage of roads, increasing the site disturbance from 0 0.88 acres to over 62 acres, and increasing the panel height from 8.5 feet to 14.5 feet. 
That's the height of the roof on a typical single story home. None of these details are found in the original application or permit. Many in our community have said that the solar developers have done a bait and switch. I question if the developers may have violated NYSERDA's code of conduct. Yet the developer may be awarded more than 7.5 million in incentives. My family home, which was built in the 1850s and is 530 feet east of the shared property line was omitted from the developer's original submittal in 2018. In 2019, the developer claimed the nearest home is more than 1,600 feet away. My family and concerned citizens requested in person, in writing, and in public meetings that my home be included on their project site plan so that my volunteer planning board can accurately and fairly evaluate the project's impacts on my home and property. As of today, three years after the first application, my home is still omitted. The planning board has not granted the amendment for battery storage. They have not granted a building permit. Um, the visual maintenance agreement to provide partial screening has not been submitted to the county clerk as required. A common access driveway agreement has not been approved. The 2019 site plan has not been signed by the, by the planning board, yet the applicant has obtained a mortgage for $28 million on the project. And this is according to the county clerk's website, the developers paid the county more than $360,000 in mortgage fees. It appears no matter what is submitted to the planning board, how many errors and omissions the application documents may contain and what the local taxpayers have to say about a project, it will move forward. The Fox has never been so clearly in charge of the hen house. NYSERDA provides model solar laws, wind laws and energy storage laws that do very little to protect rural towns and do create a great deal of environmental concern in which, the, in which the developers will prosper at the expense of our upstate communities. NYSERDA's lack of an overarching siting strategy for community solar may be increasing the number of disadvantaged communities and creating future environmental hazards in communities that have little to no resources to protect themselves. No one should have to experience what my family has had to endure during the permitting process of Oak Hill Solar. Unfortunately, I hear similar stories from citizens across the state. I hope that my written materials will assist the Climate Action Council in writing an equitable overarching plan for citing community solar projects. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And if you could press star three again to lower your hand, I'd, that would be great. Okay, so next we're going to unmute um, Dawn Montaigne. And your line is unmuted, go right ahead. Hi, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, uh, Dawn Montagna, I'm in Tompkins County. I work for Cornell Cooperative Extension of Tompkins County, the Way to Go Transportation Program. I work with a number of our transportation service providers here in Tompkins County. Um, we have a transportation equity coalition where we talk about um, a number of that uh, low income um, rural people, people with disabilities, people who are limited in English uh, face when trying to access transportation. So I wanted to bring some of those barriers um, here today. I wanted to echo some of the um, recommendations from the first caller with a focus on really looking at public, trans public transit and um, finding the resources to expand access um, for public transit, expanding their routes, expanding on-demand uh, capabilities, um, and tied to on-demand capabilities, especially in places like Tompkins County where you have um, large amounts of rural areas, also expanding broadband access that will one um, have people give people the ability to um, reserve a ride online, say with transit that might has an on-demand service, um, and also be able to do things online um, where they might otherwise be driving. I did want to talk about electric vehicles because often in rural areas, um, the only form of transportation people might have 
um, access to is their vehicle for lower income populations in particular. In rural areas, it could be that people are driving the cheapest, um, least fuel efficient vehicles available um, because electric vehicles can be out of reach financially. We have a EV um, program focused on used EVs, um, but what you don't have there are the incentives, the statewide or the federal incentives to purchase a used EV, which many people might find more, more affordable. So a recommendation that incentives are provided for used EVs as well. And then also the expansion um, into uh, historically underserved areas for EV charging stations, particularly uh, in rural areas where, again, people might not have the transportation options. But yes, a big push for um, shared transportation, multimodal transportation um, to serve those that might not have access to transportation, might not have a license. So that also means beefing up infrastructure for bicycling, bike lanes, uh, improving the safety of such infrastructure. And then I also wanted again to speak about um, affordability uh, and whether that's affordability in trying to buy a, an electric bike or an electric vehicle um, and access to credit and resources that will can help people who have poor credit scores to improve their credit. So just looking at all the interrelated components that go into people um, accessing transportation, I think is very important aside from just from improving roads or, or improving sidewalks, um, which needs to happen as well. Um, and what we're doing right now uh, in the county is a transportation equity needs assessment. I think one of the four categories of barriers here is knowledge, perception, and information barriers. And I think it's very important that we hear from the people that struggle with transportation. So doing comprehensive needs assessments um, and taking those recommendations into account when um, making changes, building up infrastructure, increasing resources uh, is very important as well. So thanks for the time, and those are my comments. Great, thank you very much. And if you can lower your hand, that would be great. And our next caller is Diane McMullen. I'm going to unmute your line now. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Diane McMullen. My name is spelled M C M U L L A N. I'm 75 years old. I live in Livingston County, about 25 miles south of Rochester. And I wanted to speak about um, being. Um, being an asthmatic, and I also was born with several immune conditions that necessitate many doctor's appointments. Um, because I live in a farming community, there is very little public transportation available, and I know other people have also spoken about that. Um, I have to rely on um, friends or um, other um, just like churches and things like that. Um, as far as um, being knowledgeable about our climate, the increasing temperature really affects my asthma and my other medical conditions. Um, I really like where I live, but unfortunately, there because of the problem with agriculture lately throughout New York State and the difficulty with farmers making a decent living, there is a lot of clear cutting going on. And that just cuts down more and more trees, which results in less and less oxygen available in the atmosphere. Um, also, they're very, if I, even if I were able to afford an electric car, there are no EV charging stations around either. And um, I live in an area which is 
sporadic internet. I was lucky to get on tonight, which I'm very grateful for, and also our cell service in this particular farming community is not very good either. Um, sounds like I'm complaining a lot, but I'm really interested in this particular um, hearing tonight, and I thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, at this time, seem to be having a little technical difficulties and just bear with me. Samir, is there any questions in the chat that you would like to do right now? Um, you know, I don't actually see any questions in the chat right now. Okay. Okay, hold on one second. We're going to try one other thing. <clears throat> so, it does look like we're having a little WebEx problem on this end, and I apologize for that. Um, Maria, if it's helpful, uh, I can see uh, some of the attendees and call on them. I don't know if I have that ability. Now, that's the problem with WebEx. <laughs> Unfortunately, only the host is able to unmute people. So I do see a couple hands raised. I see Monique and Tara, and we will get to you right. shortly. Oh, yes. We're working on it. Just Okay, hold on one second. Maybe that did it. No, I'm froze on my end, so it's not allowing me to. Hmm, too much. Hold on, let's see. If can um, this way. There is a question in the chat, but it was um, simply asking if we could put a slide with the email to send comments to. Yes, I can do that. Hold on one second. Thanks, Andrew. Unfortunately, it is uh, froze on my end. Okay, here we go. So you should all be seeing the slide that um, shows you how to make comments. So written comments are um, should be provided at best by November eighth. 
Um, and then we have a few ways that you can send written comments. Uh, there is an email address that we previously said, um, and I'll read it again out loud. It is, um, you can mail anything to NYSERDA to the attention of Elizabeth Bolton, B-O-U-L-T-O-N, at 17 Columbia Circle in Albany, New York, 12203. Uh, you can send <clears throat> comments by email to opportunities dot report at nicerda dot ny dot gov and then we also have an online public comment form which is uh, climate dot ny dot gov backslash events dash and dash meetings uh, so also at that uh, web address at the bottom we do also have a fact sheet that's available in both English and Spanish. And also um, the same information is also repeated there. And you can also find information about any other upcoming meetings related to the uh, Climate Act. So just pointing that out. Great, and I think we are all set. So we're gonna take another um, comment right now. I'm going to unmute Monique. If your line is unmuted, so go right ahead. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. All right. So my name is Monique Fitzgerald. I'm from um, North Belfort on Long Island. And I am here representing um, a group that we started in this area called Brookhaven Landfill Action and Remediation Group. Um, the reason why I'm here and the reason why we started this group is because um, there is a 270 foot landfill neighboring our community. Our community has the lowest life expectancy on Long Island. And um, we've been in the landfill has been here for 50 years. So we are overburdened with this landfill, not only this landfill, but other um, waste infrastructure, such as proposals for waste transfer stations, recycling institutions, and um, composting, all in the same proposed or already existing in the same street block area. So um, this is what we're faced with in our community. We are a community that is overburdened, but the reason why I'm talking today also is because um, <clears throat> the Climate Justice Working Group has no representation um, on its board or in the group from Long Island. And that's troublesome for a few reasons because one, there are um, event environmentally just environmental justice impacted areas on Long Island that are not currently being considered disadvantaged communities. Now I know that is a um, term that is being worked out, but it is troubling that at this point in particular time, this late in the the session of this working group that a lot of these communities have been left off of the um, of that framework of disadvantaged community. And also there's a process that I, I um, witnessed by lis listening or watching the group work that there's a, a thing called ground truthing where they look in a community to see if the map actually um, is representing the areas that it needs to. Um, and I see that there's nobody on the, the, in the group that can ground truth Long Island. So I, un, I don't understand why this group is so small and why there is no representation from Long Island, being that we have all this burden in this community and not only in, um, neighboring North Belport, but in other communities on Long Island. So I believe that it is only right for us to have some representation. And um, the other the other thing I just want to say quickly before my time is up is that um, we don't have time to prepare as we would like to, and there's a lot of things going on that's coming out of the pipe down the pike right now so fast. And I think that there should be more time for community to organize and be able to speak their truths. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And let's see. 
have one other caller. Uh, um, Tara, I've unmuted your line. Hi there. Um, my name is Tara Vamos. I'm a member of New Yorkers for Cool Refrigerant Management, which is a statewide group that I'm speaking on behalf of. I wanted to echo what Monique Fitzgerald said, where I feel like the, the time that was allotted for commenting on this seemed very short for getting into the official comments. Um, I know that I outreached to some people that were involved in the Poor People's Campaign in New York State, and they were interested in commenting, but didn't feel like they could do so in the turnaround time that's allotted. Um, and also to echo what Elizabeth Giles said, as a former person who was living in an area where I was entirely dependent on public transportation, the frequency with which the buses show up is a major decider on whether or not you're gonna take the bus. But as far as uh, refrigerant management, I just wanted to speak to something that I think may end up affecting um, food deserts and creating more food deserts that I think is an opportunity for NYSERDA to help out people that are purveying groceries in areas that are underserved. Um, right at the moment, the cost for refrigerant, which is a chemical that you need in order to run large cooling systems like refrigerators, it also runs air conditioners and stuff like that. But um, the cost per pound of refrigerants has gone up for a commonly used one from about th from $3 a pound to $15 a pound just in the past few months. It's expected to continue to rise. Those refrigerant chemicals that are that are rising a lot, it's partly because they're being regulated and partly because there are supply chain issues at the moment, but they are very potent greenhouse gases. They are 3,500 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So a little bit of leakage into the atmosphere means a large increase in emissions. A typical grocery store in the US leaks 25% of its refrigerants per year and um, that results in like for a grocery store of that size you would be talking now about um, about fifteen thousand dollars worth of replacing that chemical as well as a leaking refrigerant system is much more energy inefficient and costs a lot more to run as far as electricity so this is an additional cost that's going to be either passed along to consumers or is going to put businesses under and it's something that can be addressed with leak refrigerant equipment, which is a bit expensive to install, but reduces leaks significantly, or with um, converting to new equipment, which runs on, there's a thing called natural refrigerants. They're very cheap, but you need brand new equipment in order to utilize them. So to look at a way to help grocery stores in underserved areas and help them either install leak detection systems or convert over to new systems is something that we are asking NYSERDA to, to look at to help those grocery stores continue to exist in underserved areas and also to um, cut down greatly on emissions. And generally, they're going to need some financial help to do either of those projects. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next, we will take a call. Matthias um, Cowell, I will unmute your line. Are you on the line? Yes, hello. Um, thank you for taking the um, the time to, um, to listen what, what I want to bring to your attention. My name is uh, Matthias Calwil. Um, I'm connecting from Red Hook uh, in Brooklyn. And I wanted to bring up the issue of uh, what is generally referred to as last mile warehouses. Um, can, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So I wanted to bring to, to your attention the, the issue that we're experiencing here in Red Hook uh, with what is generally referred to as last mile warehouses. These are a new type of uh, facility that as the uh, the the boom of e-commerce that 
that we have experienced through the last couple of years um, grows are proliferating in the city. These are multi-floor, uh, multi-level uh, structures that receive an influx and outflow of uh, trucks and and vans for the deliver delivery of um, e-commerce products within the cities. And for a combination of uh, reasons that are proximity to the highway, um, what seems to be uh, the use of the um, opportunity zone incentives, as well um, as uh, apparently a loophole in the definition of what a warehouse is in the zoning uh, definitions of New York City, has uh, resulted in the burden of right now five facilities being developed in our neighborhood. For those who are not familiar with uh, Red Hook, Brooklyn, this is uh, the neighborhood, the area that was most affected by Sandy, the the storm in 2000, um, in in 2012, and it's a it's an area that has struggled to develop infrastructure for resiliency for future climate events. So we are seeing with a lot of concern the arrival of these facilities that have been installed with no form of environmental studies uh, for its impact or any type of traffic studies. Um, so, um, as I said earlier, I wanted to bring this to your attention. I was actually curious if this is being evaluated because both the emissions that these vehicles produce as well as the influx of um, of vehicles that bring absolutely no value to the neighborhood and instead completely destroy the livability and enjoyment and proliferance of public life, as well as um, pedestrian and bicycle mobility options, uh, is something that we're looking with um, with a lot of worrisome here in in our community. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you. We just want to remind anyone else who wishes to make a statement on the record to either raise their hand by um, clicking the hand raise feature if you're on the internet. Otherwise, if you're a call in user, you can press star three on your cell phone to raise your hand and we will call on you. See anyone else? Solana and Samir. Oh, there's one. There's one more person. Hold on one second. I say if you if you or if you made your comment and you are done, if you could put your hand down, unless you want to make an additional comment. Right. I think um, going to unmute Abdur Rahman. Abdur, you're unmuted. Go right ahead. Abdur Rahman, would you like to make a statement? Your line is unmuted. Go ahead. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you speak up just slightly? Sure. Um, I um, am from Buffalo, New York, um, and I. Uh some of the same concerns uh, other presenters um, discussed in terms of making sure that there is adequate um, public transportation across the state. Um, I had experience um, at one of the transportation and climate um, initiative meetings in Buffalo, New York. Um, one of the individuals there echoed some hardships that they had terms of uh, traveling in our region um, and um, in our region um, our transit authority has recently been making some bus cuts but um, I know that um, there's a, a large initiative for uh, transit agencies to become more electrified and I just would like to ask in terms of as we're making these decisions in terms of um, electrifying buses, 
or having other modes of transportation that are electric, um, that we really go ahead and consider um, and, and, and involving the people, those communities who are taking the buses and really giving that feedback um, and not jump to decisions um, without um, good data um, and its future implications um, on um, how it'll, it'll affect communities, not today, but as they receive other state funding in order to grow. So in Buffalo, um, you know, we, we got the Buffalo Billions and we've been really progressive in terms of, of um, our growth um, but um, communities are being gentrified um, in some areas where uh, the DEC map um, for environmental justice communities are not reflective of those communities um, being environmental justice communities based on that trans transformation. Um, and that's really important um, for the people um, who are displaced, who have to find other places to live. Um, and I just, um, wanted to, I, I just want to point that out. Um, I think it's, I, I think I've seen it firsthand and I, I, I don't take public transportation as much as I, I want to, but, um, hearing the stories of the difficulties people have, um, and then also seeing the types of challenges the transportation agencies are having, uh, through COVID, um, I just think it's really important that. Um, any type of work that is grounded in environmental justice, sure that there's communication between those people who are taking public transportation and those who are making decisions about where routes are going to navigate people and how those communities um, are going to grow. Okay, great. Thank you. And next we are going to unmute Hannah Thomas. Your line is unmuted. Go right ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, I have a lot of comments about a lot of things. Um, but when you say an overburdened community, um, I don't see how any of these things can really apply to people who don't even know what's going on, first of all. Um, I thank you for addressing this, but it's an issue that no one's aware of. Maybe the people that are on blog or environmental groups and DEC, but it's not out there to the community. Plus many of us um, can't change the way that we're living. We can't um, have an influence on climate change or any of that because we're renters. Um, we have no access to solar paneling. We have no access to um, transparency with our transportation system. Um, we don't have a say about too much of anything. So I appreciate this conversation, but um, until the proper authorities open up the doors and give us a, a say on um, what we can change, what we can be involved in, this conversation is is nil because um, we have no money. Um, there's no middle class. There's no way of us being involved in these changes because we're not informed about them and we don't have the money. There's no, no transparency with anyone in our bureaucracy helping us get knowledge of any of these things. You're not forcing the, the, the um, our, our landlords, because most of us are renters, to do any of these changes to affect change. So I'm listening to this conversation, but um, I don't see how these overburdened communities are even involved. It's just conversation between us. Anybody have any feedback? We appreciate your comment tonight. Thank you. And we'll go on to our next caller. I'm going to unmute Natalie Shook. Your line is unmuted. Hi. 
Um, I, you know, I've, I've, I own a business in Red Hook. I am right here on Dykeman Street, just down the street from where one of these facilities is going to be. I mean, we're all down the street from where these facilities are going to be at this point. I have two children here. Um, I feel, and I'm not sure if this is like the, if I, you know, this is the right place to be sort of calling out these grievances, but like, I'm devastated by this plan for a number of reasons. Um, and largely it's like, this is the air that my children are breathing. This is where we're spending every day of our lives. Having trucks running up and down our streets is like the op. This is like not the re we moved to this neighborhood and we chose this neighborhood for our businesses. My husband also runs a business on Dykeman street for our businesses because it's, it's quiet. We can like live, we can live our lives in New York city in a way that doesn't. We're not just, this is like, this is a beautiful neighborhood of, of New York city. This is not like, this isn't a truck depot. Um, it's going to have a devastating impact on my business. on like the, like the air that we breathe. I mean, this is, I, I don't, I don't know if this is like, I'm really sort of, I, I think I just find this whole thing devastating and I feel like New York city owes it to the people of our community to do better for us, for the people who've invested, you know, a decade of, for, for me, a decade of my life, for other people much longer, for the children who are growing up here, who are breathing this air. Um, this is devastating. Uh, and that's all. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, Again, if anyone has comments um, that they'd like to make on the record tonight, please raise your hand using the hand raise feature, or if you're a call-in user, you can press star three to raise your hand. If you've made a statement, I ask that you lower your hand. So that we know, um, Monique, looks like your hand is raised again. I can unmute you. Was there anything else you needed to say? Oh, thank you. No, I was just making sure you saw that Hannah had her hand raised. I don't know, but um, I was trying to lower it. My bad. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I mean, I, I just wanted to take a moment to, you know, to thank everybody who's offered their comments and, and Hannah in particular, I, I really appreciate what, what you were saying and, and ensuring that, that we are uh, working to really represent overburdened communities and working in these communities to make sure that the voices are heard. And I just want you to know that that's, you know, that's our job. That's also particularly my job. My job was created as a climate justice advisor in response to our climate change law to ensure that the law was implemented with a lens of justice. And I, I'm working a lot with different community groups, not just the climate justice working group, but definitely them, but other community groups as well. Um, and, you know, if you have ideas on, on people or organizations to contact, certainly want, um, would invite you to you know, send an email to the email address there and I can also you know, I'd be happy to share my um, email address with you too. So, you know, um, really appreciate your input in that. It and and then yeah, this is something that we're we're really committed to to doing. And also, just thank you, Natalie, and everyone else for 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 what you also said. And and that's what we're here for to gather this input and to you know to make to make the changes. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, at this time, I not seeing. I, I see, see we have a call-in user with the hand up. Yeah, I believe um, she four? spoke before, but I will unmute her. her. Okay, your line is unmuted. Call-in user two. Hi, it's Lynn Bruning again. I'd just like to say that I've attended over sixty CAC meetings. I've been very, very involved as a as a common citizen in what's happening. 
And I did not hear about today's public comment session until about four hours prior to the sign up was supposedly closed. And even with that, you know, I just knew to go ahead and call in anyway and hope that I would be be heard. And I fear that the CAC has really not gotten out there and has not invited public comment in a fair, transparent and equitable manner. I hope that in the future that this is done, that, that, that it's a more robust outreach process so that the people in the rural communities, in the disadvantaged communities really do have an opportunity to be heard. Uh, this energy transition is impacting everyone and we need to be able to know when to speak and how to speak with the people making the laws that impact us. So thank you very much for hosting this. I'm glad I was able to be online and uh, thank you for hearing me twice and I apologize for that. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay, at this time, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, so we do have the written addresses on the screen. Right there. Okay. Well, I, I see needs? another hand up. Elizabeth Giles, I, is, I believe she has her hand up. Okay, um, so let's see. Yep, we did hear from, hold on one second, I'll unmute your line. Go ahead, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, I, I just had a question. Um, I do know of some other individuals who had hoped to testify but couldn't make it today. If they have not yet signed up for tomorrow's session, is that still a possibility? Are they still able to sign up to testify before you tomorrow? Absolutely. There is a call in um, a meeting access number. There's no need to register for these. Oh, so okay. Anyone can join. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, I thought that I was um, submitting comments to everyone. As it turns out, it was just to the host, but um, I did reiterate my main point there and also included a link to a group that I've been a member of for a while now called NY for TCI, the transportation and climate initiative. Um, everything is very nicely summarized on their website. I think that could be a useful resource if there's anyone um, not intimately familiar with it already. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Okay, and again, the um, ways to make your comments um, are on the screen right now. Maria, I saw somebody, another hand just went up at uh, Maria Garcia, and I think uh, Hannah Thomas may have raised her hand again. I didn't know, Hannah, if your hand was still up from before or if you've raised it again. Okay, I'm going to unmute so, Maria Garcia now. Maria, your line is unmuted. Go right ahead. Um, I just wanted to make a comment regarding the public outreach process in general. I've noticed that uh, being that I work for an agency, I usually get information of this sort through my work uh, opportunities. But as far as uh, being a citizen and having some input as a regular person on the street, it's very difficult for me to find any of that information. Uh, typically, uh, that has been my experience because I know that a lot of the agencies are hoping that we as um, representatives of whatever um, area we work in, we do the outreach, but I find that um, it has been difficult to be a regular person on the street and then get information of any sort. I don't know if, if there would be an opportunity in the future to perhaps hire um, a public outreach uh, contract um, and make that something where, you know, there might be more input, let's say at a laundry or at a school or in a soccer field, just kind of like 
being out there and not necessarily relying on the regular people that are the the persons that we typically go to uh the leadership to spread the word that's just kind of like my personal experience i live in newark and i'm noticing i'm not getting any information at all as a regular citizen uh either for voting for anything regarding water quality anything regarding climate change i'm just like on my own as a citizen i have to rely on um you know my my work colleagues to get me information and that seems a little bit scary to me so that's just really the general comment. I thank you for allowing us to have this conversation and for providing this um, forum, because I think it's really important. And I did share it with other colleagues that I don't work with, and they went out of their way to you know, provide the information to others. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Great, thank you. And Alana, you said that Hannah Thomas, I can unmute your line again. Did you have? something else Whoop. your hand is raised but it's not letting me unmute your line Anna, are you, I'm not sure if it's letting you unmute yourself. Maybe you and Maria are hitting it at the same time. So can I you try so. yeah. the, um, the little microphone button next to your name? I don't know if she's hitting on her computer and unmuting. But yeah, it's, it's not it's allowing kind of me to unmute. Like flickering, but it's not going yeah. away. Right. Um, can you try if Maria, if you open up the all attendees and try to unmute her that way? Does that make a difference? Yeah, that's how I have it opened. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, then I would say try um if you can see where her hand is raised, can you try clicking the little mute button next to her name there? That might work. Yeah, and it's not. <laughs> that is really weird. I know. So apologies, Hannah. I'm not sure why we can't unmute you the second time. Um, you can also use the chat box if you wanted to type in any additional comments. Um, and we will keep trying. Hold on. Again, at this time, I don't see any other hands uh, raised. And again, if you're a call in user, if you press star three. That's all we have on this end. Again, the addresses of how to make comments are on the screen right now. Anything else, Alana or Samir, that you need, wanted to add this evening? Uh, no, if there are no other uh, public statements, uh, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, remember that we will have another public hearing tomorrow, uh, November 4th uh, at noon. So if anyone did not have an opportunity to participate, they can, they're op they're definitely welcome to come to our meeting tomorrow as well. I also wanted to remind folks that the, even though the comment period ends for the draft, the comment, you will, we will always be willing to accept comments on the uh, report and on the scoping plan. So the, these are living, breathing documents. And if there are any issues, we definitely want to make sure that we're addressing them.
Okay, great. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much for your participation, everybody. We really appreciate it. I hope you have a great night. Right. If there's no other statements, we'll close the public hearing now. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Do a do the It looks like it just froze up again, so might not be end it. End it. <laughs> just <laughs> we can never. We'll just be here until tomorrow. That's it. <laughs> just stay there. I, I did save it, Maria. Um, Good, I don't know you. if some things may have gone directly to you as the host, so there might be some things that went there, but I did save the things that I got, so I guess we'll just okay, uh, wait until your computer unfreezes and then we'll get <laughs> it that it. way. I'm glad we got through most of that <laughs> before it froze again. <laughs> It just that's it always happens when we're having an actual meeting when you're just doing a practice run. It's fine. But when you're doing right. the real thing, you get to the meeting and then everything freezes. If, if, if that were to happen in the future, though, could I, I look, I noticed in the participant thing, there's a thing that says reclaim full scroll. So, can I have clicked on that and then taken over from you, Maria, as the host? Uh, Andrea, that's a question for no, you. Maria, I, since Maria set this up, Maria's like right, the Uber. Yes. Maria would be the only one able to move the host to other people. Um, okay. unfortunately, so if like she had given me the host role, then I would be the host and I could transfer it to someone else. But, um, Maria's like the one that set this up. So, unfortunately, Maria's got to be the one to do it. And if her computer freezes, then can't do anything about it after that. Right. And it usually doesn't, so I have no idea um, what the issue was tonight. Tomorrow is another day, so we should be fine. Is it still frozen, Maria? Or yes, it is. Oh my I was gonna God. say, people who needed technical technical help with us today. <laughs> so I'm going to. Um, just stay here until it's unfroze. So, but oh, you have to stay there until it's unfroze. Oh, so you can. Yeah, I think I'm going to. <laughs> you said it unfroze last time when I shared something. So here. Yeah, yeah. Let's really try happens. to share. Yeah, share something and see. Yes, what exactly. When um, okay. Andrea. Okay. Anything? Yeah. No, not this time. I know, I don't know why. How about now? Um, no. Hmm. Well, I don't know then. Yeah, exactly. Well, I guess worst case scenario, you could just um, hard shut down your computer. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I mean, but that would erase. That wouldn't allow you to record that. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Abdur. That's what I was wondering. Is that if you do that, does it like what does it do to the recording? No, oh, it's it the recording. Yeah, it's it's actually WebEx. It's on the WebEx server. So, well, thank you again for great evening. And I think that's how I'm going to have to do it. Um, Andrea, I'm going to just do a, or does she leave? She's left. <laughs> Blame her. I'm here. Nope. Okay. I'm going to just do a hard shutdown and that's it. Okay. Well, thank you everybody who's still on and uh, maybe we'll see you tomorrow. All right.
Catch y'all tomorrow. Bye. Only no freezing. <laughs>